hand. Amen. Amen. So I have a question for you. Why is this night different from all other nights? Why did God choose this holiday to reveal his Messiah? Let's face it, he had some good holidays he could choose from, right? Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Purim, right? Joyous time. But he chose the Passover. And what's amazing is when you look at this Seder, and you look at what we do and the traditions that we have, it not only shows why he chose it, but it makes completely sense because he is the Passover. He is that sacrificial lamb. And so that's what's so important that we understand that these feasts aren't just times to get together, eat some good food, eat some matzah as well. <laughs> but it's more of what's behind it. There's a meaning that goes on with it. And that's really what God wants us to focus on. I mean, let's think about it. <clears throat> He starts with telling us from the 10th day of Nisan we're to bring that animal in to our house. Now think about this. How many of you own pets? Right? How long did it take you to name that pet? That's almost the first thing you do, right? We have two dogs. One's named Lucky. He's actually Lucky... Number two, the second. Lucky number one. How did he get his name? We had found him at, a, at a, uh, the Atlanta uh, Humane Society. And we had, when Judy and I got engaged, for her, our engagement, my engagement present to her was a full-blooded, a.k.a. registered cocker, cocker spaniel. Cutest little thing there was. But we had issues with him. He pooped everywhere. <laughs> so they told us, you put him in a cage, and they won't go where they sleep. Uh-uh. <laughs> and what they forgot to tell us, too, is you got to take his collar off. He, he would literally try to escape. And I remember we went to go see, it was Star Trek. The Wrath of Khan had just come out. We went to go see that movie, and then I came home. I, the dog was at my house because her apartment wouldn't let her have dogs. And he had tried to escape and got caught in his neck thing, and he didn't make it. And it was a very sad time. So we decided, because I couldn't afford another one, to go to the Humane Society and I remember we went and we looked, and you're looking at all these dogs, and there was just one little black dog off to the side. And Judy and I, we both saw him and said, that's the one. The problem was we were there at the end of the day, and we looked at him, and then we wanted to adopt him, and they said, you have to come back tomorrow morning. But they told us that we had to be there right when it opens because so, that dog's going to go quick. So I couldn't go. I had to work. So Judy took her 80-some-odd-year-old aunt with her. And they were right there at the front door when it came in, right, opened up. And her aunt obviously moves a little slow. A lady went around them and went over and said that she wanted the dog. Judy said, no, we were here for the dog. So what do they do? They, we had an auction. They auctioned them off. Guess who won? <laughs> so Judy goes, what do we call him? So that's easy. We call him Lucky. Because we're lucky we got him. Right? So you, you develop that personal relationship with these animals. Just like we have a personal relationship with our Messiah. 
That animal is inspected over the next four days to make sure it's without blemish. Yeshua enters into the whole, into Jerusalem on the tenth day of Nisan. Over the next four days, he is inspected. The Pharisees look at him. They can't figure it out. The Sadducees look at him. They can't get him. The high priest and the Pharisees come back. They still can't do it. Or the Sadducees, right? They go back and forth. And finally, they all determine what? Not guilty. No blemish. They didn't like what he was saying, but they couldn't prove him wrong, could they? They would try to trick him. And he would just come back with the word. So just like on Passover, he's inspected that sacrificial lamb and he came back without blemish. And that would have been enough. But God gave us more in the story. You know, when we start reading the story, it talks about the four cups and why we drink four glasses of wine. And even with that, he, when the cup that he chose to drink from, the first cup represents the cup of the plagues, right? Second cup, cup of sanctification. Third cup, the cup of... I'm sorry, is, is, what's the third cup? Sanctification. What's the second cup? Redemption, right? I went blank on it there. And he picked up that third cup. How do we know this? Because it says, after the meal was eaten. That's when the cup of redemption is picked up. He picks it up. And he says, take, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, were the disciples drinking his blood? No. Not at all. How do we know that? Some people think that. It's kind of gross, right? But here's the problem with Judaism. What do we not drink? Blood. So we know it's not his blood. He, know, he wasn't telling us to drink his blood because then he'd be going against the word, right? But what he was telling us is this symbolizes the blood atonement that atoned for our sins. Then he picked up the bread and he said he blessed it too. Did he do the traditional blessing every Christian does when they go eat dinner? Look out, stomach, look out. No, he didn't do that one, right? <laughs> no, he did the traditional blessing. He blessed it like every Jewish person would bless it. Then he picked up the matzah. He said, take, this is my body. And he told us, when we do this, do this in remembrance of him. It wasn't when we, did, when we eat... Is that important? We eat three times a day. Some of us eat five times a day, right? If you're a kid, you don't stop eating. It's just 24 hours. They just keep throwing it in. But no, when we celebrate this feast, because this feast is what points to our Messiah. We see these beautiful elements, how it takes place. He tells us to remember it. Rabbi Gamil tells us that when we tell the story, we must remember three things, right? The, 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 the lamb, the matzah, and the bitter herbs. Where did he get that from? He got it from God. God told us to do that, right? It wasn't Rabbi Gamil. But why the shank bone, the lamb? He is the perfect example of our atonement. 
That's what this feast is about. It's a feast that reminds us that we were once slaves to sin, but that God heard our cries and brought us out. He destroyed our enemies and brought us from bondage to freedom. That's what we're remembering. And then we had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years to kind of learn a lesson, didn't we? To learn to trust in the Lord. You know, the Ten Commandments start with those words. I am the Lord your God who what brought you out of Egypt. He's teaching us that this is why he did it, to be our God and that we can be his people. The good thing was it wasn't a Jewish only club back then, was it? Even in the beginning, God brought Jew and Gentile together. We celebrate the feast. When Yeshua celebrated his Passover, did they have a, the Afi Coleman? No. How do you, hey, come on, man. I read the book. The Haggadah. We got the Afi, you got to have the Afi Coleman, right? No, that was added. Why was that added? It was added to bring in when he said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So what do they do? They take a piece of matzah, the middle piece. I love the, the debates that go on. They took three pieces of matzah, they separated it. There was a, uh, a, a rabbi who also was a lawyer who did research on this to find out when this began. Because in traditional Judaism, they'll say that the three matzahs represent the three types of Jews. You have the bottom matzah represents 11 of the 12 tribes. The middle matzah represents the Levites. And the top matzah represents the Kohen, the high, <coughs> the high priest. They say they took the middle matzah out. They broke it in half. What did the Levites do that were so bad they got broken, right? They covered it in a white cloth. They hid it away. Another saying is that the three matzahs represents the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, Isaac gets the, the, the short end of the deal, right? The word afikomen is actually a Greek word. It means the dessert or to come again. But there's another theory. Theory that the Messianic believers added this to represent what he said about taking of his body. And that the three matzahs represent the three parts of God. The top matzah representing God the Father. The bottom matzah representing God the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, the middle matzah representing God, the Messiah, who was broken for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. He is covered in a white cloth to what? Rise and come again. Even the matzah that we use points to the promise of Messiah. The matzah represents Isaiah 53. It's pierced, it's striped, and it's bruised. And it's made without yeast. It's without sin. That beautiful picture that we can see of our Messiah is all right there. That's what this feast is about. It's about bringing us to an understanding that God loved us so much that he gave us his own self. He came down in the form of a man to experience what we have. And he took away our sins. When we go and find the matzah, 
The person at the head of the table has to do what? Buy it back, redeem it. Again, all these are pictures and promises of the Messiah. And one of the last things you do in your Passover Seder is you open the door for Elijah the prophet. You actually put a place setting out for him. I used to always love it, you know, that different people have different traditions. Some will just put a, a little plate with a little bit of food on it and, uh, you know, a glass of wine, right, that I think the father drinks afterwards. Don't know that for sure. <laughs> it's like putting out cookies for Santa Claus, right? In the, in the morning, they're always gone, and Dad looks a little fuller, <laughs> right? My mom would always put out a full meal, full plate, because her thing was, if Elijah's coming, he's sitting down because she had some questions to ask. <laughs> he wasn't going to just come hit and run. He was going to be sitting there for a while because she had some questions for him. But again, that's that hope of what? The coming of the Messiah. Amen. Everything about this feast points to the Messiah. It also points us to the next feast, the Feast of First Fruits. Because when our Messiah died at Passover, that was part of the deal, right? But everyone dies, right? But not everyone comes back. And three days later, on the Feast of First Fruits, we'll be celebrating it this Monday. We get to celebrate the resurrection of the true Messiah. The true and living Messiah. See, death could not hold him. Just like Pharaoh could not hold us. <coughs> Once we crossed over, guess what happens? All their weapons start going up on the shore. Now he equipped us to take on the world. When we become believers in Messiah, he gives us the Ruach HaKodesh inside of us so that we can be equipped. Now we're ready to deal with the world. When we put on the full armor of God, we should not look like a Roman soldier. We should look like a high priest. Because that is God's army. God doesn't need swords to kill his enemies. All he needs is a shofar and he'll take them all out. Amen. It's God's weapon of mass destruction. He brought us to the season. So that we can remember what he did for us. When we celebrate the Passover, we're to, to do it as if... God himself redeemed us out of Egypt because you know what? He did. He brought us out. He brought us out of the sin of the world and took us to the promised land. And that's the promises that he's made to us. So yeah, you got to eat matzah for a week. You'll get over it. But what it reminds us, when we take that matzah, when you look at it, you can remember what God did for you. And eating matzah for a week isn't so bad after that. Because if he didn't send his only begotten son, guess where you would be spending eternity? You don't like matzah now? Wait till you get down there. The grinding and gnashing of teeth. Does that sound like fun? while others will be rejoicing in heaven because he sent us the Lamb of God to take away our sins. And that's what it's all about. So remember, as we celebrate the feast and as we come back on Monday morning, 
that death did not hold him. It tried, but it could not do it. Yeshua is sitting today alive and well in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for us. And because he lives today, guess what? We can live. And we know where we're going. That's the most important part. It's not what we do here on earth. It's what we have saved up in heaven. Yeshua said it very clear. I've not come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I've not come to abolish but to fulfill. And those who keep my word, my commandments, and teach others to do so will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. And those who do not keep my commandments and do not teach others to do so will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. We are blessed to be able to see that God is giving us an opportunity to receive his blessings by following his word. Some people will say it's too hard to do. Oh, I can't keep 613 commandments. Try just keeping 10 of them, right? If you kind of keep those 10, you know, the big ones we talk about, guess what? All the other ones fall under them. And unless you're a Levite working in the synagogue, in the temple, the majority of them don't deal with you anyway. So don't think you can't do it. You can live without eating ham. I guarantee it. You might live longer, probably. It is amazing. When I talk to people, the two things that hold people back from coming into the Messianic movement And I see this time and time. I have a couple right now. I am like this much of just saying, just come already. (laughs) They're jumping from, they're getting their roots. They understand it. But it's like they jump, and no no church right now is filling their needs. It's because their needs aren't there. They're here. I can tell most of you who came here, came here searching for more. You were tired of just hearing a sermon with a couple lines here and a couple lines from there. Or maybe you got those, ha, ah, I want you to feel good. God's going to do everything good for you. It's a moment of resurrection for everybody. I didn't smile enough to get it all out. Man, our God, you know, you think about it. Most of the prophets, the people wanted to kill them. Amen. Why? Because they were saying, straighten up your life and follow the word. Let's get realistic. I really don't want people to say, oh, great message, Rabbi. I want people to say, man, Rabbi, you changed my life. You made me think. Because that's what it's about. When we come together We hear, we learn, we look at it, and we grow, and we grow closer to God. That's what it's all about. When you came here, you were searching for more. You were tired of asking your pastor questions, and they didn't have an answer. Or they gave you a, why do we sell it, why do we worship on Sunday? Because that's just the way it is. That's how I was taught in seminary, and that must be right. That's what they're told. And when you ask them, well, can you show me that in the Bible? Well, yeah, 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 just come back to me. Set up an appointment. I'll meet with you later. And he nudges his secretary. Don't make an appointment with them. (laughs) Right? You know I'm telling the truth. Because most of you all told me this. They're afraid. And most of the pastors, honestly, the ones I talk to, know the truth. But they're like, if I go out there and tell people to start worshiping on Saturday instead of Sunday and doing all these feasts, they'll fire me. 
It's job security. It's the same issue that when Yeshua came down, the Israelites were having. Remember the high priest, they, they quizzed him, right? Why didn't they jump up and down and say he's it? Because they're like, what am I doing next week? Where's my job? I'm out. He's in. But the people saw the truth. Because God's word is not a mystery. It's not a secret. You don't have to get deep into it. You don't have to know some code. You don't have to read it backwards or sideways or diagonally, right? Remember that, what was it, the, the Bible code? That was big about 10 years ago, remember? It would prove the future after it happened. You could then go back and find, if you look in there, that's not proving anything. God's word is really simple. He tells us plain and simple what to do. He gave us Isaiah 53 to know what, the, what happened to the Messiah. He also told us and showed us through Yeshua that he was the Messiah. Amen. That he died and rose again so that we can be here now as he intercedes for us. I want everyone to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to ask you all out here right now and those watching online, maybe you're watching later on. If you don't have that relationship with our Messiah, if he's not your Passover lamb, what are you waiting for? We've shown you the signs, now believe in him. It's that step of faith to say, Lord, Hineni, here am I, send me. You might be thinking to yourself, I've done bad things. Guess what? You can't change that. But God can. He will make you a new creature. He will atone you of all your past. And make you anew. And all you have to do is say a simple prayer. If you're watching online, you can contact us with the information you see on the screen. And wherever you are around the world, we will contact you and pray with you that prayer of salvation. But if you're here right now. With every eye closed and every head bowed. And you're ready to say yes to him. All you need to do is raise your hand. And say a simple prayer. In fact we'll say it with you in support. Is there anyone? Anyone at all? Then Abba Father as we come before you right now. And Lord as we continue this feast of unleavened bread going into the Feast of First Fruits and then the Feast of Latter Fruits. Lord, let us never forget the promise that you made for us and the sacrifice that you did for us so that we may be in your presence forever. Lord, thank you for taking away our sins. Thank you for coming and experience what we experienced. And Lord, thank you for letting your Son into our life and the Rukh Kahodesh to guide us. We ask this in your son Yeshua's name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand. Amen.